right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to another episode. This is episode seven of Talking TSR. Uh, I'm your host, Chris, and to my virtual left or right, we're not sure what Zoom's doing with us tonight, uh, is Rick. How's it going, Rick? It's going good. Um, my favorite time of year, man. I yeah. love October. It's cooling down a little bit. All's good. And yes. um, the pandemic does have some silver linings. I've been getting out and hiking and actually, you know, uh, exploring that great big ball called the sun that's outside of my house <laughs> beyond yeah. the games. <laughs> so yeah, it's great. How are you doing? I'm doing well, doing well, settling into uh, to my new normal and new mm -hmm. career and everything. So uh, thought I was going to miss my old job a lot more. Uh, definitely not. <laughs> and not, not missing leaving at five in the morning, uh, leaving my house at five in the morning and sometimes getting back after dark. Wow. Um, so that's all good. So uh, no, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's exciting. Um, there's a lot, I'm working on a lot of different things. So um, it's, uh, it's great. And, 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 you know, and that's with this crazy mixed up world that we have right now where we're not yeah. probably hitting on full cylinders like we normally would be. So, yeah. um, so I, you know, I, just looking forward to 2021 and um, all sorts of exciting um, projects that we're, that we're working on now that we can't really talk about. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but we will, we will, we will start talking about them um, shortly. Um, I, I would like to, so first of all, for this show coming up, uh, we're going to talk encounters. I know we touched on encounter design a little bit last time when we were talking about monsters, um, but we were, we were, we were kind of going at, at um encounters from the monster perspective last time we're going to take it from a little different perspective and we actually have a top five um near the end of the show uh, where we're going to pick our top five classic encounters from from first edition modules uh, which was a very difficult exercise i think mm -hmm. both rick and i would agree um so uh so that's something that i think we'll be able to revisit uh down the road um and do a couple of the interesting things with some different top lists um in in regard to those so um and uh and i will give a shout out that uh you know um uh, bride of cyclops con is two weeks from this weekend um so uh, hopefully everybody's going to join us then we got a lot of cool stuff going on a lot of cool seminars going on um so hopefully you guys are going to join us for that and we do have a special uh talking tsr episode at the end of that uh convention as well so yeah so yeah, we had a lot of good stuff going on. So 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 Rick, let's 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 kick it off. Let's let's talk encounters and classic modules. Yeah, let's get into it. Um, I'll I'll say right at the get go, I found making this particular top five list a lot harder than I expected going in. Agreed. It it was difficult. Um, I, I'll I'll be honest and say this is one of my lists that I think if you ask me in a week or two weeks or a month, I'm going to probably give you a different list because a lot of things just kept coming to mind. And the one interesting observation I made, and I mentioned to, to Chris uh, before the show, is a lot of the modules I really love that I consider, you know, real core classic TSR modules. I kind of, now that I'm digging down into them, spe specifically thinking of encounters, I'm finding that they're more the sum of their parts and that there's no, at least to me, very few knockout, you know, encounters that are just beyond all the other encounters. But when you look at the cumulative effect of all these little good encounters, you know, one good room after another, after another, after another, it just makes such a great experience. Um, and there's several modules I can think of that sort of, you know, hit that like, uh, you know, Castle Amber is a perfect example. Yes. Lots of fun rooms, you know, great rooms mm -hmm. with magical effects. You know, there's there's one room where you're eating dinner and there's all different foods and they'd have different magical effects and, you know, just all kinds of cool rooms with skeletons and animated things and a poly, I think a, an ogre that's been charmed and all these things. So the cumulative effect of all these rooms in a row makes for a hell of a module. But like even that module was really hard for me to try to think of just one good encounter from that. And, uh, you know, we recently worked on the um, Temple of Elemental Evil, and that's another example. There are a few encounters in there, uh, particularly on the third level, that I really love. I love the Umber Hulk encounter. I love some of the zoo rooms, and I, I love the sort of evil chapel in some of those places. But again, it's so hard to just pull out one room. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So at least that's my take on it. You know, yeah. I, I found, you know, it, it's hard. It's, it's and, so hard. And, and I agree with that. And, and, and I would have to say when I was for, when we first discussed this, for this, this topic, for this show, 
Um, I went back to one of the one of the I would say defining encounters in my game mastering and playing career, um, and that is from actually it's from Village of Hamlet, um, not actually from Temple of Elemental Evil, but it is it is the very first encounter as you're as you're walking up to the moat house and you're attacked by giant frogs, mm -hmm. and and everybody remembers that yeah. um, for some reason, and it's not an interesting encounter. It's it's yeah. literally a couple of frogs. Yeah. um and and they're in the weeds they're in the the reeds uh, uh, you know in the moat kind of thing and and they attack you and that's about it i mean mm -hmm. if you're a halfling or a gnome you can get swallowed yeah. yep that happened to my player <laughs> the one time um the the one the first time i played it and that's probably why that encounter has resonated with me and why i've always kind of gone back to that encounter and i remember um when they came up with fifth edition they put stats for a giant frog in 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 the uh the the, the play testing material and it was kind of like because that was a classic yeah. um, encounter that everybody loved, loved. but but you you tend to remember it and then you go back and look at it like wow it was literally just frogs and on the side of yeah. the road and and there wasn't really much else this you had a little bit of swallow swallowing stuff going on there yeah. but that was it but it's um, true it's so, so anyway. memorable you know i know the frog yeah. encounter and this to me the crayfish is the same way i think of the crayfish yeah. is a very standout for I me too. encounter yeah. in the boathouse and that too, I think it's when you read it, it's a pretty simple, you know. Very much so. Uh, yeah. There's a ledge, there's a little bit of treasure that you can right. try to go get that lures you into it. And then the crayfish bursts out of the water and attacks you. And it's yeah. like, yeah, that's 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 the gist of it. And mm -hmm. and a lot of it is it goes back to, you know, really what your game master does. It's like you can kind of have yeah. a subpar adventure or subpar encounters. Um, but if your game master breathes life into it, um, and amazing. We saw this with the RPGA all of the time. You know, you could, mm -hmm. but you could also take a, the best written adventure and then give it to a substandard game master, and it's not going to be a good experience. It's, it's, yeah. it's like you know, it's just you can't. It kind of can't have it like all the different ways. You can give the give the people the tools, mm -hmm. um, but then they have to do something with it. And you can have yeah. you know one of the better players out in the game might not be a good game master for whatever reason. So. Yeah. So that's, I think that is it. The older days, in the older days, back in the first edition, second edition, um, it was more about the stories that were weaved around the table mm -hmm. um, and, and not so much about the dungeon. Some of the dungeons, all right, you know, the, the, uh, the Tomb of Horrors, okay. That one probably has its own legendary. Um, and, and again, we probably could have gone through that one and had a top five. And, and maybe mm -hmm. we're going to do that at some point. We're going to dive into the, the Tome of Horrors and come up yes, with our please. top five encounters. <laughs> yeah, of, of that one especially. And um, so, yeah, it, it, was, it was tricky. It was difficult. Um, and, um, and yeah, it, a lot of these, a lot of these um, encounters, I, I don't know if I would say don't stand up to the modernization, but, but we also have to keep in mind back in the late 70s and early 80s, um, these were the first modules created. There was not a template out there. They were blazing new territory and they didn't know necessarily yeah. what made a good encounter mm -hmm. <laughs> and what didn't make a yeah. good encounter. Yeah. Um, it's fascinating. I mean, we're so. looking at, you know, 40 plus years of experience playing these games, all kinds yep. of role playing games now with all kinds of systems and GMs after this stuff came out in the seventies, a lot of it. So yeah. Your, or early early 80s you know uh, like to think we've learned something in 40 years <laughs> right exactly you know so yeah i think we have to be a little kind and look you know as we look back in history you know some some of the love is nostalgia but uh and, and some of it holds up you know yeah. I, I i do think there are certain modules that even some of these you know what i call the eight page wonders that really for bang of the buck hold up incredibly well still which yeah. amazes me Yes, uh, I would agree. And we'll, we'll get to dive into those at some point, I think, yeah. down the road. I think we'll get into a little bit. Of that. And, and I have to admit, so when we talked about this, our top five encounters, a little tongue in cheek, I, I instantly thought of a very funny encounter. Um, and I think most gamers probably know about this. And by the way, in the chat, if you guys are following along and you guys want to participate, um, by all means, throw some of your favorite encounters up there for us or modules that had really cool encounters. Um, we would definitely like to hear about it. And and after when this is posted on YouTube too, throw them down in the yeah. comments too. We read the comments. We can try and uh, make this a little bit of a two-way discussion. Um, but a little tongue in cheek, one of the first encounters I thought of, and again, urban legend kind of you think of encounters, um, is Orc and Pie um, by uh, Monty Cook. Um, silly, I remember I used to have a t-shirt for it. I had to have the t-shirt for it. 
um, because it was just so cool. But yeah, it's technically it's it's a complete encounter. This was, I believe, when third edition came out. Obviously, Monty was you know the biggest name, and and he's still very prominent in the industry right now with his own company. Um, but but yeah, it was like you know silly, yes, but also um, it's a fully developed encounter, and and you can look at that and you can say, well, yeah, geez, that, it actually touches all the bases. There's you know there's exploration in there, there's treasure in there, there's combat in there, there's you know. You know, in my opinion, as long as the pie is a pumpkin pie, you know, it's it's good, you know, or maybe an apple pie with a lattice top. <laughs> but, um, you know, so but if it's a rhubarb pie, you know, I'm not so sure I'm, I'm going to go fight that orc. So um, but yeah, so that was one of the things I thought of. I thought about putting that in my top list just just for funny. But then, you know, and, I, and maybe if I had trouble finding uh, five encounters, maybe I would have. But that mm-hmm. was so not the, the case. We could, I said, could have done a top 20 list on this. But, you know, yeah. I don't think we have enough time <laughs> to, to spend. I would have spent all day going through all my, my, know, my right? classic modules. Not that that would have been a bad thing. But yeah, yeah, there's a lot of things to do. Like, there's a lot of things going on. So um all, all good stuff but I, and i agree with you that you know modules written back in the day were certainly a little bit different um than they were now um and uh you know and and so at goodman games we were very fond of doing um the how to write adventures that don't suck um uh seminar at gen con we've done that three four years i think we wouldn't do it every single year um we did actually run it at cyclops con um last um april uh, we ran one um, and it was it was pretty successful um, and there has been two books we put out for it and it is it's 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 one of those things the game of Dungeons and Dragons is hard to learn how to play if you don't have somebody teach you um, and then teaching you how to be a game master and then designing is all these different mm-hmm. I won't say hoops you have to jump through but but it's just it's not easy it's not yeah. easy and and any way you can get any kind of advice probably helps yeah. Um, and some of this, there's not, in my opinion, there's not enough books out there, not enough resources out there that help people write good adventures and design mm-hmm. a good encounter. So, so let's, let's jump into encounter design. Yeah. Talk to me, Rick, what do you, what do you like, what do you like to see in an encounter and, right. and, you know, or don't um, like to see an encounter? Yeah. I mean, when I, when I think about designing a quote unquote, good encounter, I kind of think I kind of have my own private, like for I guess, pillars or axioms and that I think about atmosphere. Yep. I think about environment, which is not the same as atmosphere. Mm-hmm. I think about the challenge and then I think about player choice. Um, so like explaining the first one, atmosphere is just that it's the vibe. Are we going for a suspenseful vibe? Are we going for a time crunch vibe? Is this mm-hmm. a fight against overwhelming odds? You know, is this something where it's a mook stomp and it's, you know, the play, the characters are just, you know, Thor landing on Wakanda. What kind of vibe are we going for in the actual fight or the, you know, mm-hmm. the encounter? That's number one. Uh, number two is environment, which we discussed somewhat in the last show. Yep. Um, super important. You know, and all I will say about that is if you're a beginning DM and you're thinking about having like an orc encounter with characters, a fight on an open field on flat ground, rethink it. Put in trees, mm-hmm. put in cover, put in, you know, difficult terrain, put in mud, anything, uneven ground, you know, partial cover for people, whatever you can have to shake it up. It always makes things better. Uh, my third pillar is what I call the challenge, which is simply the monster or the puzzle or the trap or, you know, the negotiation, the social, whatever the th- obstacle is. Um, and then the fourth, I think, is player choice. I think if you can feed some player choice into that and not make it simply be a straight out, flat out, we've got to kill this creature, it's going to kill us, mm-hmm. usually it makes things better. Um, like a like a recent example, or a fairly recent example, um, in my running campaign, I had my characters holed up in an abandoned fort. And they had a hole up there for the night kind of situation and a bunch of giants and trolls and, you know, humanoids of various types all came in a swarm and started, you know, coming at the fort. But they were all coming in different ways. Some were coming up this ramp and some were coming in this ramp and some were trying to break down the door and that kind of thing. And the characters were really sort of outmanned, you know, but there were some barrels of flammable oil, you know, in one of the storerooms and there were some unused ballistae that they could move around. And to me, that kind of thing is I like that. 
Mm -hmm. Because then right now I'm making the players think because now the players, instead of walking up to the creatures and just fighting them, now they're thinking like, oh, you cover that door. I'll cover this door. You move this ballista over here so we can shoot this thing. And I'll move the barrels over here so we can set the trolls on fire. And now, you know, it's, it's like, now you've got your players thinking of tactical options and decision-making. And to me, if you can work that last element into an encounter, some kind of decision-making on the part of characters, instead of just like a no brainer, I've got to fight that often makes for me a really good encounter. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I, I would agree with all of that um, and play some uh, A-team theme music there um, <laughs> and you got it going on perfectly. So um, I, 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 look at it, I look at encounter design um, as the three pillars of fifth edition. I've really kind of adopted that um, exploration, so, social interaction and combat. Now, you know, a good encounter doesn't have to have all three. Actually, trying to cram all three in sometimes isn't a good thing, actually. A lot of times it's not a good thing. So sometimes you're going to have specific encounters that will be focusing on one of the three pillars or more likely two of the three pillars. Um, so so I'm always thinking along those lines. And and what you, you mentioned as well, atmosphere, uh, environment, that's good. Um, so I, I like to look at that. And, and clearly the older school adventures were very heavy on exploration and yeah. combat very light on social interaction you had to get into the mid 80s before you were starting to get into more social action and i think it almost went yeah. a little too far yeah. to social interaction you can make that argument as well where you yeah. got a little too much story um and then kind of got away from exploration i don't think it's ever really gotten away from combat because combat's mm -hmm. a staple of the game but but you do want a pretty good mixture of all three in my opinion mm -hmm. Um, but sometimes you do want to focus on some, you know, some, the focus should be exploration. And I think that kind of ties into my next point that I think is very, very important and crucial. And this is not actually really doesn't have a lot to do with, well, and that's not true. It, it does have a lot to do with encounter design, but it's the design philosophy you're going through is, is knowing your target audience, right? Knowing what sure. your players like and what yeah. your players yeah. want. Your players have decided to play in your game to show up at your table. Yeah. You want to entertain them. So, yeah. um, you know, maybe Dave is is the guy who just wants to run his sword through orcs mm -hmm. all night, okay? So you probably need to give him something to do yeah. with his sword because otherwise he's probably not going to have a great time. Now, <laughs> you can't keep everybody happy because if yeah. you've got all these diverse different people, you're not, but you, you want to try and keep them engaged yeah and you want to try and give them things to do and that can be the challenge that can be the challenge of where you said that some of of all the encounter parts so not every encounter is going to have a trap that's going to need to be disarmed but you need to have a couple in there if you play for six hours straight and there's not a single thing for the rogue to do yeah except hang in the back and wait to do a, a sneak yeah. attack probably going to look back and say that wasn't the greatest session that you know i ever played in but then dave who loves to run through orcs says you know in the mook fight he loved it and mm -hmm. thought it was one of the best things so yeah. um so knowing who your players are um what they like to enjoy and and what kind of encounters and what kind of challenges they like because the challenges are they can be combat they can be social they can be exploration um you know, so knowing what they like and kind of tailoring your encounters based on that is good. Now, and then also use that to your advantage to mix it up too. Maybe they don't like combat, but then give them a really hard combat to try and test them and get them out of their element. There's there's that part too. But, but you know, if you're designing 10 encounters and your group is a social interaction group, you know, you probably don't want eight combats and, and, and you know, one exploration and, and one social interaction. That's probably not a good mix. Mm -hmm. um so that's probably um you know a key point that i would drive yeah. home as far as encounter design i think that's a great point um it, you know it's funny like you know my players probably think i'm terrifically geeky but there's times over the years where i've gone as far as to like send out a sort of poll to my players like literally send them an electronic poll saying like you know environment would you want to do you know city or or mm -hmm. desert or forest or you know ruins and kind of asking them things like that, you know, especially when it comes to like environment or that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, Cause I, I know how they are as far as the role play versus fighting mix and that kind of stuff. But I've, I've asked my players straight out via poll sometimes what environment they want that way, you know, to exactly your point that way, rather than throw them in a big long desert adventure only to find out they absolutely can't stand being in the desert. Yeah. You yep. know, or one of these more extreme environments, desert, Arctic, other plains, underwater. Some people just don't dig that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, if you know your player's great and if you don't, it's it's a super good point to find out. Um, yeah. Because you are kind of, as a DM, you are playing for that, you know, closet audience in a way. Yeah. So, you know, if you're going to, you're going to, you want to put on a play that your audience is going to enjoy, you know. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, great point, man. All right. So um, last time we went over way over with our top list, it was the top <laughs> 10 list. So I think we're going to jump into our top yeah. five list a little bit earlier so we can really kind of dive into these encounters and talk about them a little bit. So, uh, so I think we're going to kick off. Uh, we're going to get started. I think we're going to start with Rick. And I guess, Rick, before you jump into your, your list, okay. I'm pulling my list up here. Uh -huh. I still write things out because I'm that way. Um, but I, I guess just discuss your philosophy and your rationale a little bit on how you developed your list. Okay. And then I'll do the same for mine because I'm, again, we don't know what our lists are ahead of no. time and we didn't actually get any little sneak peeks this time. Okay. So we're going into this completely blind. It'll be fascinating if we actually get this, uh, an, a similar encounter. I don't think we will, but no. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we get something from the same module though. Yeah. We, we hit a lot of the same points with a lot of things, yeah. but I, I this is going to be a hard list, I think, to coincide. Even for it us. would be, but it'd be amazing if um, it was. But yeah, so. but yeah, folks, we do not know each other's. Only our our brilliant engineer Thorin knows our our full yes. list. Yes, so. shout out to Thorin yeah. behind the shout behind the glass the doing all the, the awesome curtain. stuff. Yes, he is the wizard keeping behind us, the curtain. He keeps keeping us, us alive here. Yes. Um, so he anyway, definitely. my philosophy for this list, I tried. Maybe I was over restrictive to myself, but. I tried to keep myself to one room or one, you know, narrow encounter area, the kind of thing that in a classic module would be defined by one number on the map. And again, that was really hard. There's lots of whole levels or sub levels or, or little suites of rooms that I would have loved to throw in. But for this exercise, I went with kind of soul room type or soul area type encounters. Um, and not all my encounters involve monsters. I found myself some of the things I liked, uh, again, hearkening back to my pillars, I just liked them because of atmosphere or or a trap or, or something along those lines or an obstacle, you know. Um, I think I went into this thinking I was going to find encounters with a lot of different monster types being mixed and unusual tactics all being mixed and swirling around in one room. And when I actually drew up my list, it really wasn't about that. It came down to more just wow moments or or when I read it as a DM and thought, God, that's really a cool idea. Like, you know, or something that inspired me personally, that's what hit my list, I would say. Um, gotcha. So like, how did you, what was your philosophy regarding that? Uh, completely different than yours. <laughs> <laughs> I went complicated, mm -hmm. big, and almost on all circumstances, they were multiple areas. It was the same encounter, mm -hmm. But it was it would be like it sprawled into a couple of things. There was like sub areas and stuff like that. So it was definitely not almost none of them. I think oh, wow. one of them, two of them, two of them is like a single number on the map, as, mm -hmm. as we said. Actually, you make the argument that one of those is not either. But yeah, so I, I mean, I went for a lot going on, complicated, mm -hmm. just a, a, just a lot of different things a lot of different things and and you know what and and circumstance and whatnot um and and it was more it was more i remembered almost all of these before i even had to start going through the books so i basically was like i remember this encounter i remember this encounter then i honed my list a little bit and i was like okay no no and i was like and that's why i had to do an honorable mention because i was like no, i think I, that, that encounter really needs to be there um but I, I honestly, I didn't, I, I only really pulled a couple of books out. Almost every book I pulled out was the book that I knew there was an encounter in there that I, that I was going directly after. So, um, but yeah, it's not to say that I couldn't go and pull another five books off the shelf and find, you know, different encounters too. But yeah, so my philosophy is very different from your philosophy. That's fine. I'm really looking forward to hearing your picks. I, in so, my mind, knowing you the way I do, I have one or two modules that i i think are going to come up so I'm, I yeah see, you're probably i want to see you know them, right <laughs> you probably know i i, I will spoiler uh, i did not get any single one from one of any of our or books okay. so none none no encounters oh. were pulled from any of my or books yeah that was that which was interesting i you would have thought that since i've spent yeah. so much time on those that i would have definitely and yeah. i could have there was a good again some of the about. parts you know yeah. some of the parts yeah. exactly that, you know exactly. those are horrific modules but it's hard like again i love you know me i love the two I love the um, Temple of Elemental Evil. Love it. Yep. Was thrilled to be working on it, you know, on the or version of that for Goodman. Uh, but yeah, that's not on my list, even though I think there's so many terrific little rooms in there. Um, yeah. 
So do you want to jump into our list? Jump into it. Yep. Start with your honorable mention. Oh, honorable. All right. I'm going to throw out two honorable mentions. Okay, sure. But I'll be quick. Sure. Um, my first honorable mention sounds kind of mundane, but I, it's just, I think again, a fun room, um, from white plume mountain, there is a yeah. room with, and it's not going to be the one you're probably thinking I'm going to say, or one of the ones you're going to think I'm going to say, no, uh, it's, uh-huh. there we'll see. There's a, a room with okay. hanging discs on chains in a geyser room. And the player, the characters basically have to jump from disc to disc to disc on these swinging discs on these chains. So you have chains hanging from the ceiling with these discs swinging to and fro. And for good measure, the the wooden discs are covered with like a slimy algae. So they're even slippery. And then at certain points, geysers go off in the room as the characters are, you know, circumscribing the room. Uh, These geysers go off and can knock them off, you know, or swing these discs even more. And just from a pure fun factor, that made my honorable mention. Nice. Um, and then just a real quick note yeah. on that, because I love that encounter. I use that for inspiration in the Lost City, one of the additional areas I oh, expanded. Nice. Yes. So, and I know you don't know much about Lost City and you've no. never played it. I, that's the one I'll try to, to stay blind to. But, yes, but that, mo- that, that yeah. encounter is in there. Is uh, in, I think there's even a piece of artwork, I think. So anyway. I've, I've had a lot of rooms inspired by that. A lot yeah. of rooms I've made where people have to jump from pillar to pillar, rock yep. to rock, or those yep. kind of things. I've showed up in my adventures a lot and they're based on that. Uh, second quick honorable mention for sheer terror factor and, uh, is the last room in the Tomb of Horrors enough yes. you know d- yes. d- uh you know demi lich uh soul you know souls into gems enough said <laughs> yeah so. yeah that's definitely definitely a, a classic without a doubt you can't go wrong with that one so yeah. um i had one honorable mention uh so from s4 uh the lost cavern of to zojanth so i believe true. it is yeah um and uh so this was the last encounter there level two mm-hmm. area 20 uh it is the room with uh the vampire um and first of all so this was one of the ones where i said oh it's a single room technically it kind of isn't there's actually a puzzle before you get there and then there's teleporters to actually before you actually get into the room when you get into the room the entire room and you got up we've got the artwork shown up there the entire room is a sphere Mm -hmm. the entire room including the floor the ceiling and you show up on the balconies up there on one of those balconies you're going to show up and you're looking down at the vampire and you don't know it's a vampire by the way and, and it's a vampire that is a 13th level fighter with a powerful magic sword, magic armor, spiders of slipper climbing, um, just all sorts of crazy things. And, yeah. and just so it's, a, it's, it's your classic boss fight. You've got the environment there because you've got this circular room. The, you know, the vampire can fly or run around with the spider climb. Um, you know, fifth edition, they just give spider climb to, uh, uh, to uh, vampires now so they can all do that. Um, but so, so the, the big bad is not affected at all by the, the environment yet. The mm-hmm. characters are, which is fascinating. Um, and then you got the lantern hanging down, which happens to be an artifact. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's just, I, this is, this, this kind of, it, it typifies, this was one of the first encounters I actually thought of because I, I recently mm-hmm. re- reread this module. Um, and I thought of this one instantly for this. And, and that's why I had to put it in my honorable bench. It didn't make it because I, I had too many other interesting ones that I wanted to get in there. But, but um, it, this, this kind of typifies my encounter. A lot going on, a lot happening. And mm-hmm. definitely when you're done going through this encounter, you've got, you've got memories and you've yeah. got stories. You've got the player choices, the whole nine yards. So mm-hmm. that was my honorable mention. Nice. So. Very cool. All right. All right. Rolling on to my, what, number five pick mm-hmm. uh i would pick the tomb of Pelota room from the hidden shrine of tomoachin um now you know they use the they use the word uh uh Pelota for the for the tomb and just by way of background they're kind of referring here to the real life game that's sometimes referred to as the mesoamerican oh, ball game yes um, yes now for people who aren't familiar with this this basically in in mesoamerica it was a super popular you know Mm -hmm. ancient sport probably one of the very first team sports there ever was and they would they would play with this usually hard rubber ball on a stone court the ball was very hard it was a stone court it was evidently brutal in the players though they would wear some protective gear and you know we've had to extrapolate the rules you know 
archaeologists as best they could, but it seems that, you know, one team would drive the ball to one end of the court to score points. If you got it to one end of the court or hit the far wall, you'd score points. If the other team drove it the other way, you'd score points. And a lot of these courts, or almost all of them, have a stone like hoop or arch that's suspended, usually very high off the ground, like a good five or six meters. So it's up there. And the thought is, too, mm. that if the players could get that ball through the hoop, that's sort of like a you know, golden snitch moment. It wins the match automatically, or, or so historians think. Um, and you know, for added fun, a lot of the cultures that played this, uh, I know the Mayans definitely, um, often the losers or the losing captain were usually sacrificed, often by beheading. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the players were, were motivated, shall we say. Um, Some good stakes. And, there, you know, we, we, you can see a lot of these, these ruined courts still because of these stone arches. If you've ever gone to, uh, like, Mexico, for instance, I think the largest court ever is down in Chichen Itza, uh, or as my friend used to refer to it, chicken pizza, down in <laughs> Mexico. So if you go down to Mexico, it's cool ruins to check out anyway. Um, so this room in the hidden shrine of Tomochin was based on that. And it was a situation that if the characters open this tomb and expose the bones of these players of this game, it started this magical game of Pelota, where this ball would animate and the ball would begin striking the, the characters. And the characters then had to use their weapons to drive the ball down the court. And meanwhile, the, the ball itself would be progressing the other way down the court and also attacking the characters. So it's something where the DM and the players could track the progress of the ball as it went up and down the court. And meanwhile, there's magical drumming and effects going on. And if the ball gets to the bad end of the court, then hidden crossbow bolts, of course, shoot at the characters. And if the characters, you know, score the goal, then the ball sticks there. And then, you know, this, this niche silently opens that reveals, you know, magical treasure. And both because of the historical basis of this and just because it's so damn cool, the idea of like fighting this ball as opposed to a traditional fight or encounter. Um, that's my number five. And it really inspired, uh, again, like I try to think of works like you said about the, the hanging pillars, that thing that inspire us. And that encounter particularly inspired me. It made me go on and um, like, I, I ran an Egyptian themed dungeon not too long ago, for, a couple of years ago for my, current player set and I had them enter a living game of Seinet, the Egyptian game of Seinet. And I think the reason I did that is because I thought of this particular encounter where they, yeah. they took Pelota and they made like an animated version of it that the players would participate in. So that's my number five. I, I think it's a really fun, cool encounter. That is a solid, solid number five. And again, I know that happens to be one of your favorite modules. Oh, yeah. um, I am actually familiar with that game. I actually, um, research that game and I put that in one of my modules I think one of my fourth edition modules I think I had an encounter that was similar to that um, there was also an Indiana Jones video game one of the few video games that I've ever actually owned um, like first person one uh, Indiana Jones and there was a there was a scene with that too you had to do the same oh, thing nice. to get the ball to, as Indiana Jones you had to get the ball down it, it was a, yeah he was exploring Mayan ruins or whatever mm -hmm. um so yeah, I, I'm very, very familiar with that. So, but that, that, that's a great, that is a great example of an, an amazing encounter that you wouldn't normally think of based yeah. on, you know, true historical, well, as far as they know, mm -hmm. you know, but um, that's fascinating. Love it. So um, my, my number five, very obscure. I bet not too many people are going to get this. Um, and, uh, and I'll also talk about an unusual theme that I noticed after I put my list together after this too. So this is from module WG4, the Forgotten Temple of Tharsden. Mm -hmm. um, this is level one, the entryway, uh, areas one through 10. So it's that lower part down there in the, in the map that we have showing up there. Um, and you can see it's a room and it just has uh, numbers one through 10 on it. So this is, in my opinion, this is one encounter area, even though there's 10 numbers on it. Um, but basically, and, and, and when we're talking about the three pillars of, of, uh, it, you know, adventuring, um, exploration, combat, and social action. So social interaction. This, this is all combat. This is this is this is Gary Gygax at his finest with a very tactical encounter. Um, each of those numbers, three through ten, are a different squad of monsters, uh, Norkers, which are kind of goblin lakes and gnolls, and they all have different weapons. And there's net traps in the room. And you can see there's pillars that they use for cover. And each one of those groups has specific tactics laid out 
what they're going to do first round, second round, um, including the one guy, one of the guys down by uh, area eight, I think it is by the stairs actually goes down the stairs and just looks over from the top, from the, the, the bottom, the top stair, just keeps his eyes over and sees to make sure that, that the, that the PCs are coming. And then he goes downstairs and warns everybody else. So while you're dealing with this encounter, um, and all the different tactics up here, the whole rest of the facility is coming, basically. Mm -hmm. And on the next page of the encounter, there's an entire page, a roster, a breakdown of mm -hmm. timing on when everybody comes um, and what groups come and where <laughs> they respond from and what they do. It is amazing. Yeah. It, I would never, I've never run this encounter. I would be scared to run this encounter. There's so much going on. Yeah. Um, but it was phenomenal, the tactics that were thought out um, and really making, like you said, your players, I could easily see going into this room and, and instantly fleeing and saying, wow, we have to rethink this. We need to like, think about this. You know, we can't just go in guns a blazing here. Yeah. Um, and, and honestly it was a guy gag said his finest. And, and I mentioned this to Rick before the show. I didn't realize this when I did my list, um, of the six choices of encounters that I have, I only have three different designers that are represented. Mm -hmm. And this is the second one by Gygax. And quite frankly, um, it surprises me a little bit, actually, that I have Gary Gygax on this list, um, because I would not have thought um, that that his encounters were particularly, in my opinion, they're definitely tactically, but not like what I would consider to be a really interesting encounter. Yeah. So um, surprised me the heck. And um, and I'll have some more um, surprises on my list after that. So that's I my number people, five. That's great. Great room. I didn't even think, you know, I, I think people do think of Gygax as being, uh, I don't know, but his writing of having, has, having more of a, a drier and more academic tone to it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's a great, highly technical, because even if going from memory, even the act, just outer defense notes for that temple are extreme, yes. extreme. And that was definitely, I mean, Gygax had his moments where he got super hyper yeah. technical. Yeah. Um, that's where the tactical war gamer came I mean, out. Of them. Yeah. yeah. Cause you know, I, I, I think a little bit of the Moet house bandits, I, you know, the one yep. square tower, I think of absolutely the tower in the upper room where the tem temple of elemental evil, where there's a bunch of bandits in there that have this whole elaborate. Yep. Well, the main me, temple too. The yeah. main temple area. With, oh with yeah. The, behind, down below. The curtain and, oh, and, yeah, yeah. and the, the creme de la creme, if you want to get obscure for people who have, and I, I don't know, it's one of the WGs world of Greyhawk series, uh, the Isle of the ape. When the when the players sort of arrive to Skull Island, or <laughs> there are a bunch of natives, and they have this super elaborate attack plan, the Kamwabusas or something they're called. You know, the sort of they're sort of very typical Universal, you know, Studios natives type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but they have this whole series of you know these guys shoot and these guys throw you know arrows and you know these guys are throwing spears and these guys are releasing apes and the witch doctor is doing this and you read it and even now I would be hesitant to try to run it as a DM. It's literally that complex but yeah he was a master at that so definitely i think that's great uh all right rolling into my number four and you're gonna laugh oh. at this my number uh -oh. four is from the lost caverns of tesochent oh. and it is the inner sphere with the yeah, it is look at that we do have a Drell's laugh. Not. i'm not surprised uh, oh, because yeah. for all and i won't re-elaborate but for all the points chris uh mentions just a, a super unique room they're sort of entering the sphere coming into it on these ledges and then of course like you said the vampire she's she's wearing slippers of spider climbing so she can individually engage yep. people and run around this sphere and even fight upside down and that again player choice it makes for an interesting you know are they going to fly are they going to what are they going to do to get her down to the ground you know yeah. uh, hard opponent super cool final room and just a very uh cinematic final room you very know, cinematic, think yes. of entering this great sphere and, and this hanging lantern with magical aura and all this kind of stuff going on so uh yeah that was my number four was uh yeah. one of your honorable and, mentions and 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 the full co cover the full page artwork was probably you know it, it, maybe if that full page artwork wasn't there maybe it wouldn't be as memorable because that just right. really completed the picture yeah of what that room looked like and was yeah. really kind of essential um yeah. to kind of bring it into like a 3d perspective on what yeah. that what that room thank goodness really they like. had that picture because it yes. really yeah because the it, ledges the way the ledges come in with the screens you know yes uh, yeah that picture helped me a hell of a lot and, and 
interesting treasure also very yeah. interesting treasure there yeah. and and you know there was there was a lot and there was a little bit of exploration there too because mm-hmm. you know the 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 um you know the vampire when she turns gaseous goes into the 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 couch or whatever you want to call it the slab yeah. um so you have to you know go get into there and then there's even some more stuff down there but yeah that uh, yeah that's uh, that's great you know <laughs> and it's funny of the encounters when i was thinking about this if we were going to overlap on something i thought that one would would be one that we would overlap that's on. funny i i, I kind of i kind of figured that one because the rest of mine are i won't say obscure more obscure but yeah but that one was definitely kind of mainstream mm-hmm. so um yeah so excellent so yeah. um okay so that was that was your number four number so four. Um, my number four so um i went all the way tactics and combat with the first one so now we're going to go all the way the other direction on this one so this is from um module i4 oasis of the white palm and i'm sure you are not surprised at all that i found an encounter Mm -hmm. uh from this series because this is my one of my favorite series of modules the desert of desolation so this is uh area 12 of um the crypt of badir al mazak um the pits of everfall Mm -hmm. um so basically 200 foot shaft uh teleportation uh circles at the bottom and you don't actually hit the bottom of the 200 foot shaft, but you teleport up to the top and you just continually fall and fall and fall. Um, not a whole lot of description on this room, um, actually, because th- this is one of those rooms that will just make your head hurt on, you know, well, how do you get out of it? Or, you know, there was not a lot of you had to kind of as a game master, you kind of had to figure out how you get out of this or how your characters would get out of this. Basically, the only couple things they said was, well, you know, you're going to fall forever. You take no damage unless you stop abruptly and then you take 20 die six damage. Mind you, you're probably only fifth level at this point. So that's going to kill you. <laughs> um, uh, and, and there was an access to a lower level. If you can see the cross site section, there was actually a way to get down to the next level. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't recall if that was the only way to get down to the next level. I don't think so, because I yeah. think Hickman, um, when he designed this, had a couple different ways to get down there. Um, but there were other things already falling in perpetual motion, and you could bump into them. And one of them, there's, there's three different of these shafts. There's three shafts. They all function the same. But one had treasure falling uh, down it, like a scroll, a sword, and 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 a, a crystal ball. One had a skeleton and plate mail, and then the third one had three mummies. And <laughs> and you could like the mummies could bump into you and then get do their rotting touch on you and that, and you had like nothing you could do about it. So so yeah, this was a, a little bit tongue in cheek. This is one of those more interesting, not necessarily obviously it was it was not tactical at all, but it was a problem that it presented to the players. Um, and I just thought it was interesting. And it was one of those things. I just remembered it when I thought back to this series of modules. I actually thought it was in I3 um, Pharaoh. I thought it was in that module. I didn't realize it was in Oasis of the White Palm. Um, but uh, I just remembered this encounter and I just dove right into the book until I saw that, that, that cross diagonal. I said, yep, that's it. I'm like, I, that's one of my encounters. I love it. Um, and, and, and designed by Tracy Hickman, who I believe is probably one of the better best game designers, you know, adventure designers, uh, you know, has ever graced his presence on TSR modules. So uh, that is my number four, Oasis of the White Palm, nice. Hit of Everfall. That's a good, good choice. And I did look at that series hard. I, in my I mind, I'm I could have bi- picked a bunch of encounters from that. Yeah, series. I, I, yeah. And it, it turned out my top five list does not contain anything from the Desert of Desolation. And that really shocked okay. me because again, there's just lots of, there's a lot, there I are a that, lot. I love that whole series. So yeah, that you could get me talking for a whole show just about that, that those three modules talk about creative modules. Uh, all right. My number three, and this is semi obscure, obscure, I think, well, maybe. Um, again, going back to the WG series uh, oh. in Mordain Canaan's Fantastic Adventure. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, the Gollum Encounter, the Iron Gollum Encounter. Now, this, mm-hmm. you know, the setup for this was basically, and it's right in the beginning of the dungeon almost. It's like yes. the third room in. Yep. Uh, the characters walk in and there's this massive, you know, iron kind of colossus sit, s- seated on this throne. And he's got, you know, two statues of a fighter and a magic user, I believe it is, to either side of him. And then other like a stone gallery and the characters basically can get involved in a very difficult classic kind of, you know, guy. It wasn't written by, I don't think Gygax because it's kind of really the mayor castle. uh, So I think Kunz wrote this, but very Gygaxian, you know, killer dungeon-y kind of vibe. Um, But basically um, the two smaller statues contain weapons that can be used against the Colossus that's kind of sitting up on the central 
uh, throne. And that not only is he an iron golem that breathes fire, but just for added fun, in one hand, he's got a venomous sword made of crystal. And in the other sword, he's got a whip made of treated cockatrice, cockatrice feathers that can petrify you. <laughs> I remember it. I remember Talk it well. about a fearsome opponent. Yeah. And as the characters are fighting this big brute, the other statues in the gallery and the other statues around the room all animate. So you have, you know, a gallery of demons that are rooting for the Colossus, you know, and you have a gallery of angelic beings that are cheering on the characters. And there's sort of all this, you know, all this magical animation going on and, and rooting going on for both sides during the combat. And I always love those kind of added magical effects, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, just for a sheer fearsome encounter and just a, an opponent that the, player characters really have to think about um plus the added magical effect that was my number three uh, I, I, I just think it's very memorable you know yes and i and i will i will readily admit that if my list was 10 long <laughs> probably would have made the list because i remember that encounter um you know i it's funny i I was not sure which module that was in. I actually thought that was in Isle of the Ape. I did, I, I would have found it eventually because yeah. I, I wasn't exactly sure, but I do remember that encounter. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and that, that stuck out with me. Yes. The, the, the sword and the, the, the cockatrice feather whip. I remember the feather duster. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that was yeah. like, the feather duster exactly what it was. <laughs> I, I'm sure that I'm sure he was like writing that encounter. He looked up and saw a feather duster or That's something, right. and it was like you know, hey, it would be cool to make a feather duster with cockatrice feathers. I was like, how cool would that be? And it's like, yeah, yeah that would be really cool. Yeah. So, oh, that 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 is a great one. I love that, and I believe that the iron golem was it was like an upgraded iron golem too, wasn't he? I think he was uh, yeah. more powerful than oh, a yeah. regular iron golem. Yeah. And iron golems already very powerful. So, yeah, yeah. no, absolutely so. killer talk about starting the adventure with a bang um oh yeah very fearsome opponent all right so that was your number three so that we'll was go my to number three my number three um you're probably not going to be surprised at all this module that i'm going to pull out this is uh d2 shrine of the koatoa um uh so again gygax third gygax appearance on my list surprising shocking quite frankly uh it is so this is areas one through five so this is the big main area the cover of Called the module <laughs> yeah yeah so um, i knew that was coming yeah it, it's it's and that almost and, made and my again, list too really okay so, mm -hmm. so really it's it's kind of five oh, yeah. encounter areas but it's really oh, not yeah. i mean you got one you got two three four and then five is the guard and and interestingly one areas one through four there's really nothing going on there well, areas five there's it's a guard post but that's it but but what i love it this is all about like you said atmosphere, atmosphere. and description atmosphere, and and is i mean look at this yeah. salt hang in the air yes. you are you are yes. down in the under deep and the under dark and aren't Where's there the like slugs as from? you first walk there's, into the entrance hallway? There's like there's slugs a, on the walls. There's or... a gray right? luminosity coming from fist size. I got it written down. Fist size slug like creatures. Yeah. And that's all they call. That's all and they I say. I still remember that, that description. Fit. Yes, and green phosphorescent mm -hmm. lichen on the walls. Yes. So yeah, very alien, very and and that 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 reverse uh, pyramid there. So it's sinking down. There's water mm -hmm. there. Um, that can seat 2,000 people. It's a 2,000 seat arena, which is huge. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're a player character, you're near and like, wow, why do they need something this big? It's like, maybe there's 2,000 fish people here. This could be really, really bad. Um, the water has leeches in it. And it was funny. No stats, no nothing. You know, mm -hmm. no, you know, the swarms were not invented. Just, just full of leeches. Game Master, figure out what that means. And it's like, I remember, I was like, oh, you got to stat those suckers up, man. It's like, yeah, that's terrifying to walk through the water and mm -hmm. have swarms of leeches on you. Three different altars. There's the statue itself mm -hmm. of the sea mother, Blib Dole Pulp. Um, <laughs> and if you, if you grab her left claw, I think it is, and speak her name correctly, and there was a pronunciation guide in there, you get gated to her presence on the elemental plane of water. And if you yes. can't breathe water, she saves you and then you owe your soul to her whatever just amazing again it, it, it's one of the encounters that just jumped out at me i've run it several times um probably more because it's my, my favorite module um and again outside of 10 guards on the other side that go and alert other people there's 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 no combat in here this is all about just exploring the weird alien um you know setting environment and and it's mm -hmm. set 
lights up. It's the first thing you, when you turn the corridor and go in there, that's what you see. And you're like, this is what the adventure is going to be about the whole rest of the way. And there's something to be said about that for setting the scene of, yeah. you know, I'm going to get to that to one of my other ones about setting the scene on like, you know, the whole rest of the adventure. So, so that's my number three shrine to the Kotoa, literally the shrine Yeah, areas great. one through five. If my list was 10 long, that would be on it. Um, as well yeah. as the Dro City from D3. I would say both Got those it. two. When it comes to huge alien vistas, you can't go wrong. Um, Definitely. Terrific pick. I think if my list was seven long, that would be on it. So, <laughs> <laughs> but that was the one I called for you. I, I, I said, oh, I got to see if Chris does this one. Okay. Um, all right. So what am I up to? My number two? Your number two. I'm going to switch my number two and my number one. So roll with me here, Thorne. Okay. Um, this one is coming from one of what I call the fun house dungeons. And there's certain dungeons okay. that let's face it, you know, when you look at them, they just don't follow a whole lot of realism. You know, they really come off as, and that's why I call them fun houses. They really come off as one room after another of insanity to test the players, you know, and maybe not a whole lot of internal logic by, you know, today's design standards, you know, um, and, you know, uh, uh, there's a few modules that, that hit that bill. Um, but in this case, I'm referring to White Plume Mountain. And yep. uh, my number two is the infamous terraced room where the characters basically walk into a room and there's various terraced levels of different creatures. Yep. And you have a level of scorpions and a level of, you know, yep. uh, you know, sea lions. And, and at the bottom, you have manticores with their, you know, wings clipped and, and basically a, a series of different creatures. And it's it's completely insane in a way. But um on a sheer fun factor and a sheer, you know, players walking in and saying, OMG, you know, how are we going to get down there kind of thing? I think today in fifth edition, they would just use sacred flame and keep dropping it down on the creatures, you know, and not even leave the, the entrance way. But, you know, in first edition terms, uh, for sheer insanity and fun, I'm going to give that my number nine, my number two, because I don't think, I think that the giant crab, I don't think you can name White Plume Mountain and not have that room pop into somebody's head, I think. So yes. that's uh, my number two. I'm going to go with it, White Plume Mountain, the infamous terraced room. And and if I if I picked a, an encounter from, uh, from White Plume Mountain, well, yeah, I might pick the giant crab. But if I didn't pick <laughs> the giant crab, just because I love all things aquatic, um, I probably would have picked that room because that room did, did does come to it, my vision right when i think white plume mountain i think that encounter area i mean again p possibly the artwork has a lot to do with that mm -hmm. um but but i just think you're right there's a lot going on it's interesting yeah does it make complete sense no but it's <laughs> it's fun and it's interesting yeah. and your players are probably never gonna forget that so um so yeah that's that that that's uh, that was an excellent one so okay all right uh, so my number two, um, so uh, I pulled this one from quite possibly what I believe to be the best adventure module ever written, um, and that is I-6 Ravenloft. So Tracy Hickman back on my list again. So I've got Gygax three times on my list and Hickman twice. Mm. Um, so this is uh, area K84. This is the catacombs. So yes. again, this is really, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, you know the encounter. Yes, this I is, do. This is, it, it's one room, K84, yeah. but there are 40 different crypts in there. Yeah. And each one is its own encounter. And yeah. first of all, right off the bat, after you get, re get your read aloud description, when you walk down the hall into this room, you get the obligatory dm note on this is a complex encounter be warned you make sure you are i love that love yeah. that tipping yeah. off to the reader that yeah pay attention lots going on here mm -hmm. um there's a summary of the exits and how those exits work because there's teleporters and and the exits go to some very important encounter areas the important crypts um for the count etc um so i love that um next thing right off the after we get through all that Oh, we're just going to drop this little line in here. There's 3,000 bats in this room. They actually put down, there's 3,000 bats. Again, this is before swarms. Swarms would have made things so much easier. Um, but but we didn't. So there was literally 3,000 bats. And it's like, yeah, figure that out. You know. Um, so then after we get to that, 40 different crypts. And all the crypts are detailed. And when I say detailed, some of them have a paragraph. Some of them have one line. Mm -hmm. But they all have a little something. Yeah. Um, and some, it's just a little comedic line mm -hmm. um you know prince ariel du plumet who died from heights or whatever um some are trapped 
Some are just tricks. The, the teleporters are the tricks. That Some are combats. There's many of them that are undead. There's some clues in there, too. Um, some hidden clues uh, that actually have to do with the, uh, the, the, uh, the module. But So this one really embodies... So as my previous encounters were all heavy on, on one of the one of those three pillars this one's really got all three it's got exploration it's got social interaction with some of the npcs and it's certainly it's got combat because there are there's you know probably half a dozen or 10 of those actually had combats in them so this one really checks off all the boxes and again is it cheating is it really more than one encounter yeah probably um but it's just fascinating um, and it really, again, I knew there was going to be an encounter from I6 was going to make this. Um, and, and again, I6 was another one. I love that module. And I went through that module and I was like, wow, you know, a lot of these, this, this is another classic example of what Rick said, the sum of all the parts. There's not that many actual outside of when I mean, you run into the actual vampire. Um, you know, there's not that many, the encounters are okay. They don't probably stand, but this room just yeah. takes the cake um in my opinion and uh and and just had a lot going on and just was fascinating i loved it so that's my number two good choice i don't remember even a lot of castle strad but i remember the catacombs you know yes and yep. i always love those areas like that where the players could check out multiple things whether it's multiple boxes or chests or crypts or or you know magical ingredients pools. or alchemical. pools of water <laughs> well exactly right yeah. you you beat me to it i was going to say like one of the reasons i think in search of unknown b1 is such a sort of classic uh and great module for beginning dms is the pool room i think the pool room is one of the yeah. most brilliant things just all these different pools with these crazy different, you know, things going on. Uh, I love that, you know, or, or these laboratory rooms where they, you know, there's all these different boxes and things you can fool around with and play, you know, it's just like, uh, it's like being a kid with one of those busy boxes, you, you know, your players can mess with everything. So uh, yeah, I wholeheartedly uh, think that's a good choice. All right. all right, hearkening to my number one. And again, number my one. number one and two, I've been kind of flip-flopping them. Um, and this Literally. one really, again, I surprised myself by there isn't even a monster in this encounter. It is just, to me, atmosphere and spades. Uh, it's from the Forgotten Temple of Thuriston, oh. and it is the Black Cyst. It is basically okay. the yep. kind of ultimate or final mm -hmm. area um, yep. in that if the players drill down deep enough and fool around with enough magical paraphernalia that they pick up, religious paraphernalia, they can gain access to this area that's this kind of infamous area that's underground called the Black Cyst. And just the descriptions, I mean, there's several areas in that module uh, that have these just wild, cool descriptions. And uh, it's, it's a really interesting module because the top layer is more mundane with a lot of interesting tactics and humanoids. And then you kind of delve underneath and then you start getting to these magical effects, you know, of the actual Thurston stuff. Um, but yeah, just a description, because it's basically uh, a situation where the, the characters find these incense burners and this magical horn and, and these robes, you know, and all this religious paraphernalia from the clerics who used to be in the temple. And if they do certain things, a cylinder made of violet light basically comes up from the floor and then a, it has a, a dead black core. And then that becomes surrounded by mist. So you've got sort of like a black pillar surrounded uh, of light, surrounded by a purple pillar of light, surrounded by gray mist. And then if they swing these uh, these kind of you know these these incense burners, they can sort of burn their way through the gray smoke, and the violet cylinder will literally become violet steps that go down in a sort of spiral stairway around this black central core. And they make it pretty clear that if you touch the magical, the central black core, you're in big trouble. <laughs> and you basically forge your way down where it could even be Tharizdan himself is sort of this great form is stirring and there's treasure down there and there's, there's cold effects and the, and the characters have to be doing all these things to stay alive because everything becomes freezing cold and they're, they're swinging the incense to keep the, the mist at bay. And there's this incredible feeling if you're playing this or running this even as a DM of kind of, because I've done this more than once, of we're going to get trapped down here. That there's absolutely, I think I've never seen a, a group go down there and not been in terror of getting back out because they're, they're doing all these things just to kind of stay alive and not freeze to death in this freezing cold area. 
And again, it's just this very otherworldly area. They make it clear it's this, they, you know, they literally call it a black cyst. It's just this, you know, spherical uh, room deep below the ground. You don't even know how far below ground it is. It's not something where you just walk down a flight of stairs. This is something where you're going down magical stairs to get there and you have no idea when or if these stairs will disappear and entrap you in this area forever. So uh, just for sheer cool, Gygaxian coolness, that is my number one is the uh the Excellent. black cyst from uh, the forgotten temple solid solid choice wow i'm shocked that we have two encounters from i know WG4. that's funny wow that is hilarious <laughs> wow all right all right now my number one um and again this is another one of my favorite modules of all time um comes and this is this is this is another one i'm really stretching the boundaries here on what an encounter is but um but i'm going to take the sum of it as an, the entire thing is an encounter so this is from uh, module B10, Night's Dark Terror. Mm. So this is the Siege of Sukaskin. Uh, so this is, I, I took a picture of this. I laid this all out on my floor. So this is a poster map. So those mm. are five foot squares that you can put your, your minis in. Um, and basically you're in a homestead, uh, very beginning of the module. Uh, you're in a homestead and you have to survive through the night when they're basically under siege um, by goblins. So as you can see, the entire... Um, the entire homestead is mapped out uh, different levels, obviously. Uh, there's a tower, uh, there's a fenced courtyard. Um, so it's defensible. So same like you were saying, giving your players choices, there's uh, defensible areas in that. Uh, full of NPCs, so you've got your social interaction. Your exploration comes from exploring what you have to use to defend it. Um, and then you have several skirmish-like combats throughout the entire night. There's events that are set up. Um, that uh, happen at a certain time during the night, including one really cool one where there's a, a woman screaming um, and you see the woman in a, in a dress in, in the gloom of the darkness and it's really a goblin in a dress trying to scream like a human. Um, and if you go out to try and save her, then, you know, the goblins jump you. Um, but it's just, I find it fascinating. It's it's um, it well-designed. Obviously, this is this is before third edition, so before poster maps and, and minis were a thing. They gave you at the bottom, and you see there the, there's cardboard cutouts they yeah. gave you, punch board that they gave you to use for all the goblins and everything and the NPCs, um, which is amazing. Um, and just gave you a fun thing. I You know, when I was putting my list together and I pulled this out and I showed it to my son, um, who's, who's an avid game master now, he was just oh my god was he thrilled with seeing this poster map and all of the possibilities and then you know and i was showing him the random the not the random encounters but the the siege encounters uh the timed encounters um and and it was just he was in awe of it and 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 the even the goblins are not boring goblins they had interesting leaders the leaders were named they had interesting treasure um there's the one group of goblins has vampire bats there's a hobgoblin there's wolves mm -hmm. Uh, there's bodyguards, there's the, the leaders on an ice wolf, which was a new monster. So it just really, they went out and detailed the whole thing. Yeah, there's there, there's the cardboard cuts. I see you haven't punched yours either. No. Um, so, um, <laughs> but, uh, but just, I love it. It just, again, gives you all the tools and there's just a lot going on there. Is it one encounter? I think it is, but yeah. yes, it's clearly a whole bunch of different areas. It's, it's, yes. it's a set piece. It's a huge set piece. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a lot going on and, and I just, you know, amazing, amazing encounter, um, and sets up the whole rest of the module. The rest of the yeah. module is nothing like it, but it just is a, it's a brilliant opening scene for the module to kind of get you mm -hmm. into it. The players know that they're in for something completely different. So that is my number one. And, and I kind of knew that was going to be my number one. When we mm -hmm. talked about this, I was like, oh, that's my number one. I'm like, I, I knew that that one didn't change. The others moved around a little bit mm -hmm. after I picked them out. Um, but that one, I was like, definitely number one, without a doubt, just from this year, the poster map and, mm -hmm. and the the, uh, the siege encounters, everything through the whole thing. Love, love that encounter. That's a great, I, I again, if, if my list were 10, because that's why I've got it here. I, I literally pulled this out mm -hmm. because I wanted to look at it. And and for the record, Night, in my opinion, Night Star Terror is is one of those overlooked, I think, Gems, yeah you know well, i think it's got a lot of bang for the buck there's so much stuff amazing in there. amazing and all amazing these maps and little sub areas crawl. and sub dungeons yes. and and you can get a lot of you know a, yeah a, a lot of material out of that uh, there is there is it's and and i yeah. i agree i think it's by by far i think it's the best um you know basic expert level module I've ever written mm -hmm. and i think it, it it needs to be up there higher than it usually is i, th I think yeah. the true 
the the true hardcore folks like you and i i think they they know its value um yeah i hope so because it, yeah it's i'm not a huge fan of i have to i'll be honest of a lot of the expert set type modules you know yeah yeah but that one to me really knocked it out of the park in a lot of levels talk about uh, bang for the buck for your i would whatever. agree i don't know what the sell price was at the time for that module. i don't either um but, but yeah it was, it was you know i've got it right here i bet you it was 10 bucks <laughs> That's uh, does like. not seem to have a price on it of course yeah, not i'm guessing eight to ten dollars i'm thinking it's ten which is a lot back then yeah. yeah i mean how many how many sessions of play could you get out of that $10? oh god yeah a lot definitely a lot so, so excellent right. over one choice nice so that was um that was our top five lists i see we're a few minutes over but we're okay we had a couple yeah. little more bookkeeping things to do here so um so yeah so that was our top list we can certainly revisit um, this too yeah again we at, should. At another time we yeah i think we definitely will and, but i think we'll we'll do a little bit more detail too we'll yeah. dive in we'll pick a module it's, or something right as you were saying chris you know and we have plans to go into certain modules i think are module series and future shows so i think it'll be one of those things where if we take a show right and we examine uh you know uh, an adventure series you know of, of two or three joined modules then we can maybe go into our five best encounters from that that series yeah. or something like the descent series or whatever it is um I agree. great so that's yeah that's our top five uh so our next show is coming uh again on sunday october 18th now we're gonna this is gonna be during the bride of cyclops con so i hope you will join us and we are going to come on a little earlier than usual we're going to come on at 8 p.m again on October 18th during the con. Yep. So while you're attending other events, I hope you also join us that night. Uh, yeah, well. hopefully by that point, you're going to be gamed out and then you're going to want to just <laughs> yeah. stick back and listen to a couple of guys talk about That's TSR. Right. And yeah, I think we're going to, we're going to, our theme for that uh, uh, show is going to be playtesting adventures. I will actually yeah. be playtesting an adventure a couple slots earlier in the convention. Um, and uh, and I'm actually running a playtest for a a project I can't talk about yet. Um, and Rick will be running a play test very soon too. So I think we're going to have a lot of play testing yeah. discussion to, to talk about, about, you know, styles of play testing and everything. Um, I want to give a quick plug to Bride of Cyclops Con, um, October 16th to the 18th. Uh, there are still some tickets left for some premiere events. Um, there are seminars. We've got a lot of interesting seminars. We've got, uh, obviously there's going to be the what's new at Goodman Games. Um, we have, uh, we're trying something new called Stump the Game Lizards. Uh, TSR used to do an old uh, seminar at Gen Con called Stump the Game Lizards. So we've assembled a crack panel of Goodman Games experts to, uh, to see if you, the fans, can stump us with trivia questions on our favorite games. Um, so hopefully we'll see if, if that's popular or not. Um, and then we're also going to have our, um, we have a special seminar for our 5e open call uh, if folks uh, that are fans of Goodman Games. Uh, we did announce, we teased uh, about a week ago that we're going to be getting very close in uh, later in October. We're going to be actually putting an open call out for some 5e content, uh, writers, editors, and play testers. So there's going to be a special seminar um, at CyclopsCon uh, for uh, that uh, open call. So if you're interested in possibly trying your hand at writing some 5e material uh, for Goodman Games, uh, you might want to check that out. Um, and with that, we will jump to our uh, Pearls of Wisdom and... Um, why don't uh, you lead it off, Rick? Sure. Um, well, for my Pearl of Wisdom, I'm going to harken back to my Pillars of Adventure design. And again, kind of looking toward, you know, aspiring DMs or newer DMs. If you're building those encounters, uh, like I mentioned earlier, try to build in player choice. Try to put in either uh, some kind of variety where the players can explore different options, different tactics, uh, or different even areas of a room to fight from or that kind of thing. Give them options. Um, to me, you can never go wrong if your players have choices. You're making them think you, that engages people, that pulls them into your game. Uh, so that is my Pearl of Wisdom. And my Pearl of Wisdom, also hearkening back to the, the pillars of, uh, of 5e adventures. Um, but I'm going to go back to the uh, know your players, your target mm -hmm. audience. Um, and, and that is, and, and, you know, when you're developing your encounters and your adventures, um, and remember an adventure is just a series of encounters. Um, you know, so, um, know your, you know, your players know what they like, know what they don't like, challenge them. Don't always give them everything they like, but definitely, you know, hedge the bet toward them and make sure you keep them engaged and, and, and you give a little bit of something for everybody. 
Um, you know, you know, it might be hard every session to do that, but certainly, you know, you shouldn't go two or three sessions with, you know, the cleric not having anything to do. Yeah. Um, so that would be my pearl of wisdom for the week. Um, and, uh, with that, so we will see you again. Remember we're two weeks from this weekend, um, two weeks from tonight instead of three weeks. So we're on a little bit earlier and we hope to see you guys all, um, after a very long, exhausting three days of, uh, Pride <laughs> of Cyclops Con. So, we are looking Rick. forward to it. And Hey, if you, if you, if you like what you're watching folks, uh, on Twitch, uh, give us a follow. If you're watching us later on YouTube, uh, please give us a like or better yet, subscribe and ring that bell because that helps us a lot. And as Chris mentioned earlier, feel free to comment even on YouTube. Uh, we do read the comments. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, but with that said, we will see you in two weeks. Great. And have a good one, everybody. All right.